So, without further ado, I would like to introduce the first uh, presenter, Joanne Sweeney Burke, to the stage. Thanks, Lorcan. I'll just keep an eye on the time because it's a, it's a busy session and I know you guys want to get to lunch, but it's a very important session. Um, I started my career in radio, actually in Highland Radio in Donegal. I then moved on to PR and worked in corporate communications, but 10 years ago went out on my own, which was very bad timing because it was 2008 and then everything went belly up and nobody wanted PR and marketing services. But I quickly saw the waves of digital and social lapping at my ankles and I realized that I had to evolve and iterate to be relevant to, to my sector. So I followed that. Um, and if you think that social media and digital isn't relevant to you, then just ask law enforcement agencies right across the world. I wrote a book in it two years ago, how law enforcement are using social media and digital communications for crime investigation, public interest messaging, and community engagement, all of the things that you guys do. Um, the other thing to say is that not all the answers are going to be here today or they weren't yesterday. The agency session this morning was very interesting. You're also not going to go away. Um, I was in Brussels a, a couple of months ago and there happened to be a lunchtime session on the future of news and media. It's an excellent essay. If you want the link, drop me an email or send me a tweet. My Twitter handle's up there. These guys, these researchers in Europe predicted populism and politics. They predicted the global economic crash and they also predicted um, the rise of digital. What they're predicting in the world of media is that print media, they've suffered a 20% loss between 2010 and 2015. Radio has held its own. It's stabilized, but the audiences are aging. Nothing that you don't already know, but you need to evolve. The other thing that they're saying is that news and journalism is going to be commoditized. Who owns content? We'll listen to Jessie, who will tell her own fascinating story. Content is not owned by any particular media right now. I have my own podcast. I loved radio, so two years ago, I went back behind the mic, and my podcast speaks to marketers right across the world. It had 10,000 downloads last year. It's not a lot, but guess what? What radio station is going to give me a platform to talk about uh, digital marketing or social media? So let's just look at some of the stats. 94% of Irish people shop online. We are digitally tuned in. One stat that I was really surprised about in January when figures were released is that there's been a 17% increase in Ireland in people buying professional services online. Oh my God. I was like, yeah, woohoo for me, who's selling professional services. Consumer behavior has dramatically changed because of the smartphone, and we need to react. If you want to know how consumers are changing and how they're behaving, the only thing that you need to do is watch Facebook and see what features and functionalities they are bringing out. They have the most money, probably along with Google and Amazon, yeah, the big Goliaths of the internet, but they are studying consumer behavior and what is changing. So modeling what they are doing in your own way is good advice. We spend 1.31 hours uh, on social media every day with on average five active social media accounts. We are the most social in Europe. When I'm working with the 217 MEPs across the EU and 27 member states, the first thing that I do is look at how people are using social media in any of those countries. Ireland always tops the league. We love social, we're highly engaged. You know, we're, we're a nation of storytellers. One in six minutes online is spent on Facebook. Facebook and Google and YouTube got in trouble. They were hauled before the Congressional Committee in the US in November because of fake news. It is a problem, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, this is where you can step in because people trust you. People trust local radio. My mother said when I left Highland Radio, this is the dumbest thing that you're ever doing. This is the best job that you'll ever have because you work in local radio, you are famous or quasi-famous, you know what I mean? People love you, they trust you, they believe you. Um, and it's always been um, the best platform that I ever had. Um, Ordinary people, not just weirdos like me, lift their smartphones 200 times per day. They have done the research. You are carrying people in your pocket. Brands can carry their customers in their handbag or in their pocket. So adapting and having a mobile-first mindset is really, really important. 
when I work with Google, and next week I'll have Premark and Vodafone and BMW in the room, and Google hire external people like me because they say we want industry people to, to tell our biggest spenders what's happening. These brands are also in flux, so don't worry, you're not alone. Mobile mindset is really important and understanding how people are consuming your content will help you. One in five minutes online is spent on a mobile phone and mobile search overtook desktop search in 2016 in 10 of Google's biggest markets. It also happened in Ireland. Now, Ireland isn't one of Google's biggest markets, but interestingly in Ireland, we seem to have the, the trends that Google is reporting globally. This is something that may be a bit technical, but anybody in the room that is looking at Google Analytics, there's a new column in your Google Analytics dashboard. You can now track conversions on mobile. So you can now see if people are making a purchase, starting on desktop and ending up on mobile. This is interesting because brands will argue, and this is for the agency people in the room, brands will argue that there's no conversions on mobile. But yes, there is. And anybody of us that are in business, what do we care about? We care about where the biggest opportunities in our business are in. The biggest opportunities right now for all of us is in mobile. And then web traffic on smartphones in Ireland is almost a third higher than the EU average. It's pretty remarkable. I'll put these slides on SlideShare so you can get them, and I'll, I'll tweet them out. So some things I think you should take advantage of you have a loyal audience base. Oh my goodness, do you know how hard it is to grow an online audience and Jesse can share that with us? Yes, you can't automatically transfer a, an audience from on air to online, but there's ways around it. You have content that's ripe for repurposing. Not everything should go online, but snackable content is really good. Natural storytelling talent. I mean, when I'm training, uh, journalists or marketers, they're 90% there. I'm just giving them the digital edge. You have a book of advertisers. When you win your license, when you get that geographic boundary that says you can broadcast in this particular area, you know, you're over the moon. You step online, you're no longer competing in that license area. You are competing with the other people in the room. Google says, don't worry about your competitors, you worry about the consumer because you need to be best in class. There's not a whole lot of new stuff that you need to learn. You have program directors, right? Those program directors need to be thinking about an online schedule. Avoid unrealistic expectations on staff. Luckily, when I worked in local radio, you only did the news and you didn't double job anywhere else. But you cannot expect staff to suddenly understand social and digital and get return. You need to invest in them. And I think the work that Learning Waves is doing is kind of remarkable. It wasn't around in my day. Failing to invest in digital is failing to invest in your business. Um, I believe that Jane and Laura are not the only figures that matter, um, and outsourcing digital you don't need to do. The Edelman Trust Barometer measures trust around about organizations across the world. For the first time um, this year, they've found that the trust in the media is at an all-time low. Data-driven journalism is the future, it's the now. If you want to get people to engage with news online, go here. I'm doing a piece of work on the referendum that's coming up, and I am tracking what conversations are happening online, and you can see who's winning the debate online. Finally, Google and YouTube, understand your audience. You segment your audience more than just where they live and their age profile. You, um, I'll finish up with Casey Neistat. CNN bought him for 25 million a year and a half ago, believing that they could acquire an online audience and be in the online space and be relevant. Didn't work. About four weeks ago, they separated. They bought his app Beam, yeah? And what happened? Casey wasn't re relevant to a scene in an audience. Develop the talent in your station. Don't be hiring influencers. There's the roadmap. You can, I'll, you'll see it in the slides. I don't have time to go through it. But suffice to say, my final thoughts, don't be the blockbusters of the radio industry, okay? This is what you need to do. You're 90% there, invest in digital, trust in the people that you have, nurture them, um, and yeah, have faith and go forward. The, the future can be bright. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Joanne Sweeney Burke. Okay, in this uh, segment, we're going to actually uh, just kind of get to know um, um, Jesse a bit more. And it's, a, it's an extraordinary thing that 
today, like we have, like, you know, just to, I suppose, introduce yourself, uh, just to who you are, where you're from, uh, Jessie. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jessica Kavanagh, I'm 14 and I started a YouTube channel in 2015 and I'm from Drada. You're from Drada, so yeah. what, what, what made you, or what, what kind of, I suppose, inspired you to kind of uh, get into YouTube in the first place? When I seen all my like, favourite celebrities on YouTube and uploading all their makeup tutorials and everything, I really wanted to be like them, so I started my own one. Okay, so at the moment then, at the, uh, well, at the moment now, you are at how many subscribers? Uh, over 220,000. 220,000? Yeah. And you started two years ago? Yeah. And the, the, where do you get the ideas for content or uh, you're, you're creating content or what, where is it? Is it just from? Um, when sometimes I make up my own, but other times on social media or on the comments of the YouTube channel, uh, my viewers comment, oh, I'd like to see this video or I'd like to see this. And then I film that video and then the following week, they're eager to come and see what it's like. So you're really kind of getting, I suppose, the content from your audience of yeah. how to do this and kind of go at it. So who would your, be your, your top three kind of influencers who you look to or to get uh, inspiration my, from? Yeah, my favourite would be um, Zoella, Tanya Burr and Anna Sakona Jolie. Okay, now we asked the audience, like, do any of you know <coughs> um, those three names? Um, uh, how many hands could, could we put? Or? Just the okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Okay, so in the intro, uh, we mentioned that uh, you produced a, a tutorial video, and over the last two years, it has 40 million yeah. um, viewers. Is this something, or where do you see yourself going with um, uh, your YouTube channel? Or what, 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 do, you, what do you hope, or what's your, your, your dream? Um, well, my goal would probably be to get like 500,000 subscribers and then go to a million. And I aspire to be like Zoella, Anna, and Tanya Burr and to hopefully one day make a career out of it. Make, make a career out of it. <coughs> yeah. So at the moment you're in, um, you're in, what year in school? S uh, second year. Second, second year. Yeah. Okay. okay, I'm feeling very, very kind of inadequate here at the moment. <laughs> um, second year. Um, in terms of actually, and I know I've got, I've got two kids myself at, at home, or two kids, uh, two, two, well, uh, an 11 year old, I actually kind of, my 11 year old daughter actually kind of heard me calling her a, a kid. She had, um, I, I, I could feel my ears kind of burning, but um, my son is 15. Um, at, at that age as well, like you know, you're looking at, I, I suppose, the technology that's available to you, like you know, to produce this. Uh, produce content like this, and I've I've looked at other I suppose YouTubers on, online, and maybe not in your particular space, um, but Jack Septic Eye and along those kind of lines of the, the the production value is extremely high. What type of I suppose technology do you use like when you're producing these YouTubes, and how long does it take to produce? Um, well, like what type of is it just true YouTube or do you use any kind of editing kind oh, of type? Um, yeah, I, so I film it on YouTube and then to edit I use Final Cut Pro on my laptop and yeah, I just kind of, that's it, yeah. Fi Final Cut, Cut Pro and, yeah. and, and go to production. Yeah. So you mentioned then like your objective or your actually kind of dream then is actually kind of to get for 500,000 within the next... Um, in the next couple of months maybe by the end of the year. Yeah, and then in terms of monetization then are you... Um, how, how do you look to in terms of, as a, as a, you mentioned as a career, like is it something, could you just mention maybe a couple of things of actually how you like to see how you could actually kind of make money out of, uh, of this particular? Um, yeah, so I do make money out of it every uh, month. Uh, the, mm. It's like Google AdSense and ads. And just when you film videos and when they put ads on it and then when you do get paid for it, that's kind of good to make a career out of it. Yeah. Is there any kind of advice you'd maybe like to offer kind of radio of actually how what you do could actually kind of advice that you could actually offer to the people in radio and what you do? Um, well, just kind of really be yourself and show everyone else what you can do and it will bring you somewhere. Yeah, I, 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 I think actually there's something that, um, and I met, I, met, um, I met Jess out in the corridor, is there's this real sense of being authentic um, and I think we've heard that where sometimes it's been kind of bandied about, but there's a real sense of kind of honesty and being, being yourself that yeah. actually kind of is an extremely kind of core value that uh, <coughs> where an audience will follow. Um, Jess, look, uh, thank you so much. I can imagine it's a, been a big kind of deal kind of coming down, but I thank you very much for kind of coming Thanks, down and yeah. joining your join, uh, sharing your story with us here this morning. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Jess Cameron. Thanks. We now, um, we now actually are going to pass um, a presentation over to uh, Glenn Mulcahy of uh, Titanium Media um, on media or mobile tools and technology for radio.
Glenn. Um, I was going to do a presentation and then having listened to the guys this morning talking about money and where the money needs to go, I kind of thought, okay, I'm just going to throw all that out and just take it back to really, really brass basics. Because the session that um, I was asked to talk about this idea of technology for radio and how mobile can be used for radio, but I think the very first thing I would say to you is I'd absolutely amplify the message that the guys said this morning. Like, you need to diversify beyond this idea of thinking that what your product is is just what you broadcast in a linear model over the airwaves. Because you are a media, a multimedia brand. Whether you've completely embraced that or not is, I guess, the fundamental burning question. But, you know, a few tidbits just to take away from this. So, if I bring my career journey back to the very early days, I won't tell you how far back. Nearly your day is actually. Um, I knew that I wanted to work in television, and uh, you know I, I, I applied to pretty much every media course in the country to try and get in, so I could learn how to make TV. Got rejected from every single one of them, and uh, my last choice was to end up doing an art degree, no S, A R T degree. Uh, but the college, uh, which was WIT, they had just invested in loads of broadcast gear, and it was sitting in boxes because none of the technicians in the college knew how to basically build a TV studio. I was really lucky because my father, who used to work in telecom hearing back then, um, he was into gear. So I got those genes. And um, I kind of covertly, over a couple of days, built the television studio down there. And they hired me after I graduated to come back and give them a hand running it and teach it on other students. And that was the back door in because that led to a gig in Galway, that led to a gig in TG Carr, that led to a gig in RT, and the rest, as they say, is history. But I just want to share with you for one second exactly how dramatic things have changed in the last 10 years since the evolution of smartphones. Because when I got into TG Carr back in 1997, they had a state-of-the-art editing system, and it was you know 13 million euros worth of infrastructural investment, and all the guys were running around with, with top-of-the-range broadcast cameras. And I remember just thinking, like, Jesus, the money! Like, it's incredible. The editing system was an 80,000 euro standard-definition editing system. All the guys had big, massive ENG cameras, just like the ones you still see today, with the vast majority of camera crews around the country. Sat truck, half a million euros on four wheels, huge money. We've gotten to the point in the evolution of the 10 years that these devices have been in the market where they started out and the camera on them and everything else, forgive me for swearing, was pretty shite, okay? But over that arc, over that 10 years, they've not only come to the point of meeting some of those broadcast standards, in the last two years, they've actually excelled beyond some of those broadcast standards. And it, it still humors me somewhat when I go into organizations and people look at me like that's the lunatic about the mojo stuff, because I still get that look on people's faces. But I'm just going to give you a couple of examples, okay? Because what you see in front of you right here is just a smartphone with a couple of accessories added onto the outside to try and enhance some of what it can do. Kits just like this have been used in my former employer in RTE over the last five, six years, actually, to create an awful lot of news content that's been broadcast on the national uh, channels. We've never once actually put up a bug to say this was shot on mobile, because you don't need to. The, the audience, frankly, don't really care too much about the actual device that you make the stories on. As long as the stories are 100% credible, they're engaging, and they actually have some value for the audience, that's what they care about. And to speak to you, I guess, as, as, you know, as radio stations, both as a national, but more so on a local level, about 15 years ago, Des Whelan, who I, I've been trying to scan the audience to see who's here, but I want to name check him, because 15 years ago, I'm from Waterford, Des Whelan um, set up a kind of initiative in WLR called Waterford at Eight. It was the first attempt that I'm aware of to kind of do a local TV service in a, a local radio station. And I, I got involved with it for a short little period of time. I was on a career break from RTE. And what amazed me about it is, is that he had effectively completely and utterly copied the same technology solutions that RT would have used, which meant it was really expensive. And that, that was its ultimate undoing, that the cost model simply didn't work. As a basic business proposition, the money going in to make it work and the money being generated by the advertising on the back end of it just simply didn't add up. Now, you jump forward to where we're at now, and at the end of March, you're going to see a movie that was shot by Steven Soderbergh, who, you know, Ocean's Eleven, Aaron Brockovich, He's releasing a movie that was entirely shot on iPhone. It's going directly into a cinema release, March 28th. And it's the same technology that you've got in your goddamn pocket, okay? What's the difference? Well, it's the skill set. He knows how to use it as a visual tool. He knows how to use it as a camera. So here's the thing, the thing that I want you to think about if there's any takeaway from this session. It's that probably everyone in your organization has one of these tools in their pocket. For a couple of hundred euros stuck onto the outside, a solution for a battery, a microphone, and some sort of a tripod, you can potentially start to empower your staff to become complete cross-platform digital content creators. What does it take to get started? Well, a little bit of innovation, 
a little bit of risk, so be prepared to experiment and let them try, let them find their audience in your community and let them actually develop a language and a tone that speaks to that audience. Because you have the tools, it's literally on your doorstep. And if you think I'm talking, I could again use swear words, but I won't, but just listen to what the guys told you this morning. Diversify the model so that you engage with your audience on different levels. Because you have the tools, they're there right now in your pocket. So all you have to do is be prepared to take that small little leap of faith and try. And if you do, and if you develop the skill set to actually be able to tell great engaging di digital stories across every social media platform, find your audience and talk to them there. I promise you, you'll be able to come back to the guys that you heard this morning and tell you that it's going to be flat going forward and give them a whole new business proposition. The business proposition is not just your listenership, it's the audience engagement that you're getting across digital platforms all of which have really good measurement metrics. You can show them in hard facts how much your audience is engaging. It's there for the taking. That's me. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Glenn, um, for that. Um, I'll just check my phone now to make sure if it's, yeah, I'll be. <laughs> um, moving on, Michael Hill. Michael. Thank you. OK. Um, I'm going to um, stand up and walk around a bit because I've got a lot to go at and I want to get through it all. Um, I'm Mike. I run Radio Player, which is a collaborative radio platform run by broadcasters for the good of radio. I'm going to give you a quick idea of what that means over the next 10 minutes or so. Um, when I was a kid, I used to love getting these at Christmas. Chemistry sets, electrical sets, mixing things together to see what you could make. Now this is actually one from the 1950s called the Atomic Energy Lab and it came with its own uranium. So I didn't have one of those, uh, which is why I was able to have kids I guess. Um, <coughs> but little Johnny there looks like he's glowing a bit. Um, it, the magic formula though, the thing that I was always looking for in these chemistry sets, I think the magic formula for us today in radio is yes innovation but also cooperation. You heard that loud and clear earlier in the agency session. These guys want us to work together across our industry, because we're only a small industry, and we need to punch above our weight. Now, <clears throat> yesterday was a big day in the UK radio player world. We launched a new app, which is coming here as well soon. Um, we unveiled our new brand, the new red radio player brand, uh, and we also started a national ad campaign for radio. So because it's a radio conference, I thought I'd play you that promo. On the radio, on the radio, on the radio. Radio player. All the radio you love, everywhere you go. And everyone is singing along. Radio on your phone, at home on your smart speaker, and in your car. On the radio, oh, no. Radio. Everywhere you go. Search Radio Player. On the radio. So that's a lovely track by Scouting for Girls called On the Radio. It's got energy. It's all about togetherness. It's all about music and passion. And we thought it fitted exactly with what radio means and what Radio Player means, because that's what, what we bring to people. We bring radio to people. Now, we don't just do it in the UK. We do it worldwide. Eight countries now using the Radio Player technology. And we're all around a table talking about stuff and investing in the industry's future all the time. Ireland is huge around that table, uh, very influential in this group, and we're very, very proud that Ireland is one of our um, main countries. These are our three priority areas, protecting radio in cars, growing radio in smart home devices, and growing radio in our web players and our apps. I'm just going to very quickly canter through each of those with the last one first. Why should we get together and cooperate on shared apps and web players. Why should we do that? Well, driving discovery, keeping people with radio. They're going to get bored of your station at some point. And if you want them to go to Spotify or Netflix or YouTube or Facebook, that's fine. But I don't. I want them to stay with radio. I want them to maybe listen to another station, and then they'll come back to you. The search engine and the recommendation engine that's built into Radio Player bubbles up content that they would love and keeps them locked into this medium. Your competitor is no longer the station down the road. Your competitor is Facebook and Netflix and Google and YouTube and Spotify. Boosting revenue, big commercial features built in from scratch to Radio Player. You can switch them on uh, if you wish, and you can leave them off if you don't. 
Uh, video pre-roll is making a lot of money for radio stations in the UK, and programmatic audio um, in-stream ads is also making a lot of money. So this is ad replacement, replacing the FM spot ads with targeted, localized um, adverts in that in-stream output. Simplification, keeping radio simple. You can see the controls are all very, very similar across those three web players, even though the branding and the content is very different. It's a common user experience. And bridging into new spaces. I'll talk a bit about more, more about that in a minute. This is what the current radio player apps look like, very visual. This is what the new radio player apps that we launched in the UK yesterday look like, much cleaner look, much more modern, with the station brands right to the fore. Um, Bridging into spaces, Chromecast TVs is a good example. This Chromecast is a dongle that people can plug into the HDMI socket of their telly, uh, and they're doing it a lot, casting from their phones to their TVs. So we've made sure that Radio Player does that as well. It sounds great if you've got a sound bar. It looks great because we generate this live feed of social and music played from the station. We put a logo up in high res, so we're trying to make your brands look great on TVs. Um, cars is the second area. Probably fair to say it's the um, top of our priority list, actually. We're doing loads in this space, so I'm just going to canter through some of it. The first thing we do is we make sure the radio player streaming app integrates well with the kind of systems that car companies are building into their dashboards. Connected cars are using Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, and now Smart Device Link, which is uh, a system developed by Ford and they open sourced it so that any car company can now use it, and Toyota have picked it up as well. We think radio apps should be compatible with these systems so that people can get into their car, pair their phone with their touchscreen, put it away safely while they're driving, and use it on, on, in their car through voice commands and through steering wheel commands, so radio player is compatible with all those three platforms. The second thing we do is we build stuff. This is a system we actually launched in the UK last year called Radio Player Car. It's a hybrid radio system, which means um, the system automatically follows your station across DAB, FM, and streaming. If you lose signal, it automatically retunes, and it's voice controlled as well. Now, the learnings we got from that took us to this, a partnership with Audi. So starting in the Audi A8, which is there, but also rolling out to all Audis and VWs shortly, radio player data, including data from Irish radio player, is flowing through to Audi, so that in their beautiful cockpit, when they press the radio uh, button, you see a single station list across all platforms, DAB, FM, and online. One station list, and automatic station following. So if you lose signal on DAB, it flips to FM. If you lose signal FM, it flips to streaming. And so we're powering Audi's radios and soon VWs as well with data flowing from Irish radio player and the other radio player countries. This is how it works. The radio player country's data is represented on the left there, these big buckets of logos and streams and all sorts of metadata. On the right is a connected car. Now, we don't just give away this data. We don't let them have it for free. We put it under lock and key, and we only license it to car companies that do the right thing by radio. This is where we get a bit of strategic traction as an industry, because this data is valuable. What do we mean by doing the right thing? There must always be a button marked radio on the dashboard. I know it sounds simple, but some car companies are getting rid of those. They're, they're calling it a media button or an audio button. No, we believe radio should feature front and center on the dashboard. So we're requiring them to have a button marked radio if they want the good data from us. No over-the-top monetization. They're not allowed to re-commercialize your streams because that's just rude. And they need to respect your brands and your logos. No cropping or skewing or stretching of your logos. And that final one, in a hybrid situation, they, prior they must prioritize broadcast. That means um, they must try DAB first, and then FM, and then streaming. Because actually, broadcast is cheaper for you guys as broadcasters than serving streams online. It's also cheaper for the user, because it doesn't hit their data plan. So that stuff is complex. But this stuff is complex too. And that's why we need to cooperate in this area as well, smart speakers, because these big tech companies are really hard to talk to if you're just a single broadcaster. We need to get together as radio and talk to them. Now, I don't know if, um, I know that um, Alexa has been around in uh, Ireland for a while now, 
I don't know whether you guys have tried it out. Um, some people describe it as a magical experience, talking to a plastic cylinder, and the plastic cylinder responds and, does, and brings you stuff and plays you stuff. Um, some people also think it's turning us into a nation, a nation of rude people, because barking commands at a thing is not doing us any good. In fact, a colleague of mine said it's turning our daughter into a raging asshole. <laughs> now, you know, whatever you think about whether it's you know, doing that or not, actually it's growing really fast. In the 18 months since it launched in the UK, it now has a penetration of 14% of UK households. That's just Amazon Echo. Uh, forgetting Google Home for a moment. 90% uh, say they love or like it when it appears in their home. 81% use it every single day. This is starting to sound a bit like radio, right? And indeed, radio is king. On the Amazon Echo, radio dominates use above Spotify, above Amazon Music Services, and above podcasts. This is a very quick example of what it feels like to use the skill. I didn't uh, manage to video myself um, doing it in Ireland on the Irish radio player, so this is me in London just asking for a station. Alexa, ask radio player to play Radio 5. Now playing BBC Radio 5 live on Radio Player. If crime mentioned there, that was up 26% year on year, with nearly half of that increase Alexa, attributed to... ask Radio Player to recommend a station. Why not try TalkSport? 3 a.m. I'll just uh, move on from that, because um, actually that was us in the crawl phase. Uh, we're doing crawl, walk, run on this stuff, because it's really, really complicated. It's really hard to build these things. That crawl phase for us looked like um, ask for a named station, ask for recommendations. And that recommendation was powered by our algorithm, which looks at what else you've listened to and suggests stations that we know will be like it. So that was our crawl phase. Actually, we've just gone up to the walk phase in the UK. We launched Catch Up and Podcasts as part of our Alexa skill about two weeks ago. So we're just seeing how that goes in the UK, and then we'll roll it out for you guys in Ireland as well. Uh, and God knows what run looks like. I mean, this is already taking up a huge amount of our time. It's really, really quite hard. And there's no way that you guys can all do this in your individual silos. We need to get together and work together on this stuff. Why? Not because Alexa's going to be selling 15 million of these devices in everyone's homes. Actually, if you talk to their Amazon executives, they really don't care how many of these actual devices they sell. They've got a much bigger goal in mind, and that is to get Alexa baked into light bulbs, fridges, toasters, dishwashers, ovens, cars, everywhere. Pretty soon, everything you buy will be voice controlled, and I'm pretty sure it will be a battle between Google and Amazon as to who controls that. Now, what that means is that we're kind of um, unknowingly turning our houses and our cars into intelligent webs of machinery that are able to kind of talk to each other across our Wi-Fi networks. Um, and this, is, this was actually envisaged uh, in an article, oh, actually in the 1950s, um, they built radios into fridges. So there's nothing new here really about appliances becoming intelligent and offering radios. But actually last year a guy called Walt Mossberg described this kind of um, spread of uh, intelligence as ambient computing, the transformation of the environment all around us, with intelligence and capabilities that don't seem to be there at all. So my final thought is, where is radio in this? Where is radio in a home full of ambient computing? Because all these things could be radio devices. And I know that actually we could increase the reach of radio if we can get this right. We can do it by innovating, but we have to cooperate as well. We can't do this in our individual silos. We have to work together. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.